also holding on to a specific day. You see what I'm saying? If, if let's look at it. Let, let me let me say this again. If a specific day was not important, number one, why do you think that God gave a prophecy warning us that eventually the man of sin would seek to change the day? Why would God do that if it wasn't important? There must be an important reason why. Now, if it can be showed from the Bible and also confirmed by history that this prophecy has been fulfilled and that it was fulfilled by the very same system of Antichrist that God said would do it, and that this is also the very same system that he said would blaspheme against God and persecute his people, and that this system is also has also openly admitted to the change of the Sabbath, then do you think that this change is something that God could endorse or accept? Not at all. And if God would accept it, don't you see that he would in fact be agreeing that Antichrist is right and he himself is wrong? God would be admitting that the Antichrist system is above God's authority. If God were to accept something which man instituted and put in place of what he instituted, he would be admitting that man has more authority over him and can overrule his word at will. So, yes, there is a specific day because God specified a day in his law of moral, his moral, his moral commandments, his moral law of Ten Commandments. And as I said earlier, there are many who who will contend that, oh, there's no specific day, but at the same time, they themselves are adhering to a specific day while dismissing the specific day that God specified in his law. Why? Seems to be a, a, a problem there. Thank you. So the question in the written statement was that it said, Specifically, that this issue of the seven day Sabbath is Jewish. So I would like for you to address that as well as to tie to that that I don't need a Sabbath because Jesus is my Sabbath. There's only one Sabbath that you tell me to talk about, and that is Jesus. Well, the, the, the saying, the, the, the reality is this, right? Um, that there are those who will say that I don't need a Sabbath. Because Jesus is my Sabbath. Yes. And the reality is this, that Jesus is not only our Sabbath. Jesus is much more than our Sabbath. The Bible tells us that even before I go there, let me explain something. The Bible gives us signs and symbols. Because God is teach, seeking to teach us spiritual truth. He gives us physical symbols in order to illustrate spiritual truth. For example, he gives the communion service to illustrate the deliverance. He gave it to Israel in the Passover when he was getting ready to deliver them from Egypt, bondage in Egypt. And that they kept that, observed it for like 1,500 years. And it was supposed to teach them a spiritual truth not just deliverance from physical bondage in Egypt, but the deliverance that God himself gives, deliverance from sin. And so when Christ came, he instituted in its place the Lord's Supper, the communion service, to teach us of the deliverance that Christ comes to give, that he gave us through his life and death and resurrection from sin. The Bible gives us baptism as a physical symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and invites us to enter into that experience. Romans chapter 6 tells us, know you not that those who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. And he goes on to tell us that, and then we are raised up to walk in newness of life. So the Christian experience of conversion, accepting the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, and being raised up to live a new life, to show the world that now you've become a member of a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. All of that has been given to us in symbols. And we can go over and over and over and show how many things God has given to us in symbols. So for spiritual truth, God gives us physical symbols to teach us of the spiritual truth. 
just like marriage. Marriage, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And he goes on to speak about how the relationship should be between the husband and the wife. And then he goes on to say, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 28 to 32. So the reality is this, right? God gives us in our physical realm certain things to teach us about certain spiritual truths. So Christ is our Sabbath. In the Sabbath, we have the literal, physical, actual observance of the Sabbath day as given in the commandments of God. But then there is a spiritual application to that also, which is the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. The rest from sin. The rest that we have in Christ. Christ says what? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, does the fact that there is a spiritual application negate the need or the necessity for the literal or actual observance? No. When the Jews were given symbolic symbols for animal sacrifices, they were pointing to Christ. If they had neglected to do these, they would have sinned. The animal sacrifices couldn't save them, but these were commanded by God as observances to which were connected to a spiritual truth which they should follow and enter into the experience of that truth. We look at 1 Corinthians, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Let me take this a little further. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. It tells us, notice, notice this, Christ is not only our Sabbath, he's not only our rest. It tells us, but of him, in other words, of the Father, are you in Christ Jesus. Who, this who refers to Christ, of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Christ is our wisdom. Just like Christ is our rest, Christ is our wisdom. Well, does that mean we don't have to function with wisdom in our daily activities? Does it mean that we abandon any exercise of wisdom in, 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 in our daily life? We can just go about with reckless disregard for any kind of caution or reason or wisdom just because Christ is my wisdom, so I don't have to behave wisely? Does the spiritual truth that Christ is my wisdom dispel the necessity of me behaving wisely? Well, it says that he's made unto us wisdom and righteousness. Okay, so Christ is also our righteousness. Well, does that mean that, okay, I now have the freedom to live unrighteously and to negate from my life every bit of living according to the principles of holiness that are given in God's word and to live loosely and unrighteously and to go about doing all the things that God condemns in his word as sin using the excuse that, well, I can do this. I don't have to live righteously because Christ is my righteousness. I believe every sincere Christian knows that the fact that Christ is our righteousness doesn't give us the license to, be, to live unrighteously. The fact that he's our wisdom doesn't give us the license to, to neglect or to cease to live and function with wisdom. But it says he's also our sanctification and our redemption. It says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So I guess it's okay then for us to, to be unsanctified in our daily life. I guess it's okay then for us to live like we have not been redeemed, live like lost ones who have not a father in heaven who has shed his blood through the son Jesus Christ for our sins. So the reality is this. The idea that Christ is our rest, to use that as an excuse to negate what is written in the commandment that we should rest on the Sabbath day because Christ is our rest. If we are going to be honest, we have to be consistent. It would mean, therefore, that the fact that as we're 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Christ is our wisdom, we should also have the license to function within our foolishness and ignore the tenets of wisdom in our daily activities because Christ is our wisdom. It should also mean, therefore, that we can live unrighteously because Christ is our righteousness. So the reality that there is a spiritual truth and a physical or literal observance which points to that truth, the spiritual truth does not negate or do away with the necessity of what God calls us to do in terms of observing what he has given to us on the physical plane. They go together. In other words, the form and there is a substance. The form needs the substance. The substance needs the form. Just like baptism has the substance to it, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, God commands us, be, go preach the gospel, baptizing them. So we, they need to go together. And we have to be consistent. I hope that answers that question. It was a lengthy answer, but I hope it at least addresses the question to show the inconsistency there in thinking that, okay, Christ is my rest, so I don't have to keep the Sabbath. So that's your death. Thank you. So as you were speaking, another aspect of the question statement came to my mind, and it was this. Are you familiar with the council meeting in Acts chapter 15, Pastor? I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 15? What about Acts chapter 15? The council, the Jerusalem council meeting. Yes. All right, okay, so in there, the question was states that no mention is made in, in here about not using food that sacrifice animals and other things like that, but it doesn't mention anything specifically about Sabbath teaching. How would you address that? Well, you know, Brother Vernon, um, there are a lot of things that weren't mentioned there. And it, it, that, uh, that's an argument that I've heard many times before. And it says, well, these things, Sabbath keeping wasn't mentioned, so we don't have to keep the Sabbath. Well, guess what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me wasn't mentioned also. So I guess that means it's okay for us to go and worship other gods. Thou shalt not make other graven images and, and bow down to them wasn't mentioned either. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, it speaks of fornication there. But thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shall, you shall honor your mother and your father. You shall not covet. These were not written in that document there also. So that argument means, therefore, then, again, we have to be honest. We're dealing with the word of God. And there is consistency in the scriptures. If the fact that the Sabbath was not mentioned in that document that was given in Acts 15, if that means that that therefore does away with the necessity of converts into Christianity from keeping the Sabbath, then it means that all, all these other things that are mentioned in the moral law of God, which were not written in that document, like worshiping other gods, and stealing and lying and coveting and murder and all these things, it means, therefore, that these things are okay to do too because they weren't mentioned there. But we know that they're not. No true Christian, but these weren't written there. So it shows, therefore, that the issue is not really with a document. The issue is merely a desperate attempt to find a way to do away with that one point in the moral law of God, which God prefaced by saying, remember. So the issue has to do with finding ways, trying to cunningly find ways to do away with the Sabbath. And these arguments are all very shallow because the Acts 15 thing, I don't even see why people even go there because so many other things were mentioned, were not mentioned in there that we know as Christians we're supposed to do. The reality is that why weren't the Sabbath, why wasn't the Sabbath mentioned? Why wasn't worshiping false gods and all these things mentioned? They were dealing with specific issues that particularly related to the Gentile in that particular context. Certain things that were being imposed upon them. And the issue was dealt with. And then they said, we see no further because. We, we will just tell you, do these, do this. It doesn't mean don't do all the other things that, are, that God commands us to do. 
It was dealing with specific situations, and that is why those were the things that were addressed. There was no necessity of telling them not to worship other gods. There was no necessity of telling them to remember the Sabbath day. There was no necessity of telling them all these other things because those were already a given. Those were not the issue there in that situation. Can you address where, well, no, can you conclude with any additional things that you would realize that you did not mention about the issue? And also, can you just speak directly to those persons who may have heard all these things? You've addressed a lot of what I've heard, what I grew up hearing, what I grew up believing. So can you address me and tell me, you know, why is it important that what you're saying is basically true? And why and why is it important for me to be to have a, a proper understanding of all that was addressed today in light of the fact of what I grew up hearing, what I grew up believing, what I grew up practicing, if you understand the question. I, I do. And I, I'll just go into a little bit of history, if I may do that, just to use a couple of minutes to go into a little bit of history, right? There, there's an argument that you hear from time to time, and I've heard it many times, that Saturday or the Sabbath, Saturday is undeniably a Jewish thing. And it's not required for every person. Matter of fact, I saw where one person wrote, oh, you can't deny that. You know, I'm always intrigued with the way people think. I don't take words lightly, so I squeeze all the meaning out of them. A statement is made, person who makes it says, you can't deny that. Well, not so fast. Don't jump to such a conclusion without hearing the counter evidence. Because making such a, a double claim, such a claim, does not make it a fact that Saturday is just a Jewish thing. Indeed, I can deny that statement, and quite emphatically, on the basis of Scripture. There is absolutely not one place in the Holy Scriptures where it says that the Sabbath was a Jewish institution. Not one place. But before I even go into the Scripture, let me just give a little bit of historical background so that it can be made clear that there, that these are opinions, you know, they are opinions and they are hard facts. Facts that can be substantiated by history, by anyone willing to know the truth. And the idea of the Sabbath being a Jewish institution, this is a sentiment which is neither supported by the Bible nor by history. It developed during the third and fourth centuries, a period which involved what, you, what scholars today call the de-Judaization of the Christian church. Much of this was due to antipathy against the Jews, due to their constant rebellion against the Romans who were occupying their territory in that time. Everything associated with Judaism was stigmatized to blacklist their religion. And the Sabbath was suppressed and its observers were persecuted and the Jews themselves were partly responsible because they had perverted the Sabbath. They had turned it into a legalistic observance giving it a bad name. They had abused it, filling it with their hundreds of fanatical and I must say nonsensical rules. Even Socrates himself, ancient Greek pagan believe, pagan, you know, even him, he had, an, he had enough insight to say this. He said, no belief system should be judged by its abuse. So the Jews abused it, but don't judge it because they perverted it. You can't judge water as being a bad thing because some people drown in it. No, because if you do, the next step is that you're going to try to make a law to, to pass a law abolishing water just because some people drowning it. You can't just stigmatize and throw the Sabbath because the Jews perverted it. No. During these centuries, the second and third centuries, when the Jewish religion was being blacklisted, the Christian church was coming under heavy persecution also at the same time by the Roman emperor, Diocletian. But then came Constantine to power as the Roman emperor. And by a decree called the Treaty of Milan, he ended the persecution against the Christian church. And he did this not because he had become a converted Christian, as many will tell you, but because it was the politically expedient thing to do. Rome was facing many uprisings in its territories. There was rising inflation caused by draining the public treasury to maintain wars and wars of conquest. 
And this resulted in much social and political unrest in the empire. And meanwhile, though they were under severe persecution, the Christian church was growing rapidly so that even members of Caesar's household and members of the Roman military were accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Constantine inherited this very volatile situation, but he was a brilliant political strategist. He realized that even years of the worst persecution that was designed to wipe out Christianity only caused it to spread more rapidly. And so to consolidate his power and stabilize the government, he decided to end the persecutions against the Christians that were started by his predecessor and to harness the power of Christianity by legitimizing it and co-opting it, hijacking it then, making it an agency of the state. There's a saying, if you can't beat them, join them. So he signed a decree ending the persecution against the Christians, and he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He converted many of the pagan temples dedicated to sun worship, which was the, Ro which was the worship of Rome, and he converted these temples over into cathedrals for the Christian church. And the statues of Jupiter and Zeus and Poseidon and Mercury and Demeter and all these were replaced by statues called St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Matthew, and all the rest of the apostles of Christ. And he started paying the bishops and the leaders of the church huge salaries from the state treasury. He even declared himself a Christian and decreed that anyone holding certain high political office had to be a Christian. And so the pagans came into the church in droves, not due to a conversion to Christ, but for political opportunism. They were still very much pagan, but they were using Christianity for opportunity. So when Constantine came to power, he politicized the church, making it into an agency of the state, corrupting it and merging it with sun worship which had been the official religion of Rome. And so pagan ideas and teachings came also into the church during this time by the, these sun worshipers seeking for power and influence, declaring themselves as Christians. Because Constantine said, oh, he's a Christian. He was trying to unify the empire to stabilize his power. So the teachings of the Bible were infused with strong doses of pagan ideology. And so, they, 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 there were those who said, look, what, this is wrong. This is not happening. The, the leaders of the church said, no, if Constantine is giving the church power, we're going to take it. And so there were dissension. And the ones who decided, no, this is wrong. It's going to corrupt the church. They ended up becoming persecuted by the very church that was persecuting them, that was being persecuted before. And so the church prostituted itself to the state and soon started using the power of the state to persecute dissenters the minority, the true faithful believers who were standing on the commandments of God had to go into hiding. Now, let me just take two minutes and wrap up the point I'm making, a historical point. By March 7, 321 AD, the emperor Constantine made a decree forbidding work from being done on Sunday and making the seventh day Sabbath an ordinary working day. I'm giving specific dates because it can be researched and found by anyone who is interested in the truth. In fact, when you read an excerpt from this law that Constantine made, the very first sentence of this decree stated, on the venerable day of the sun, that is Sunday, notice, the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in the cities rest and let all the wor workshops be closed. Notice the word venerable. It means to give worshipful respect to the sun, the day of the sun. That is why it was called Sunday, because the day on which the sun worshippers worship the sun. And notice the venerable day of what? The sun. So the whole text of this law can be found online by anyone who cares to know the truth. It's no secret. In fact, when you look at Chambers Encyclopedia, it says this on the subject of Sunday. It says unquestionably, the first law, whether ecclesiastical or civil, by which the Sabbath observance of that day is known to have been ordained, is the Edict of Constantine in 321 AD. He's saying the first Sunday law made to enforce worship on Sunday instead of the Sabbath was by Constantine. This is the encyclopedia. All of this is public knowledge. And many, following this initial legislation, 
Many emperors and popes in succeeding centuries added other laws to strengthen Sunday observance while pressing down, pressing down the Sabbath and persecuting those who refused to give up the Sabbath in obedience to God's command. So what began as a pagan ordinance ended up as a Christian regulation. On the heels of this Edict of Constantine followed the Catholic Church Council of Laodicea in 364 AD, at which Sunday worship was now officially made by the Catholic Church, officially made the day of worship for Christians according to a decree of the Catholic Church. In fact, the, in the Council of Laodicea, one excerpt, it says, Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day, Sunday, they shall honor, especially honor as being Christians and do no work on that day. And if they are found Judaizing, like observing the Sabbath, they shall be shut out from Christ. This is, this is a historical fact. So the Christian church started to separate themselves from any identity or association with anything Jewish. And they started saying the Sabbath was a Jewish ordinance and they distanced themselves from it because of the stigma that was associated with it. So a lot of people are chasing, but I'll say this, I can give, I can give a dozen statements. I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm ending now, but I can give more than a dozen statements from official documents of the Catholic Church where they admit, they say, we have changed the day and those who worship on Sunday are subject to us because we have the authority to change God's word and they follow what we do. So they are actually giving obedience to us. That's what the Catholics say. Many official documents, and we can provide those quotations. And anybody who wants to know the truth knows this. There is no direct command given in the Bible, no command given to change something which God instituted from the very creation of this earth. And he wrote it with his fingers on tables of stone. None. It cannot be proven. So I know you don't have a million dollars, Brother Vernon, but you can challenge anybody that you'll pay them a million dollars to show you where there is a command or any proof that the Sabbath was changed from seventh day to Sunday. You don't have to worry about paying it out. There is absolutely no proof. The Catholics themselves admit that there is no proof. It was changed by their ecclesiastical authority. I just want to encourage those who are seeking for truth to realize that truth is not popular. Christ says, I'm the truth. He came on this earth and the majority rejected him. It's not popular. But God will have a people who love him enough to honor him, comes what may, and to stand for the truth, even as Noah and eight did when the vast majority were mocking and they ended up getting washed away with a flood. May God help you all, bless you all, and enkindle a desire for what is true within each heart. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Ken. I just would like to request that you close us out and just seal all that was just mentioned in prayer. But before that, I would like to ask you if any person who is listening or will listen later would like to get in contact with you just to speak to you one-on-one -on -one or just to ask you further questions about what was discussed today, how can they reach out to you? Oh, by all means, they can, they can call me at... 954-478-4673. I'd be glad to speak with anyone, even if they want to challenge what I've said, but make sure there's evidence because I have a ton of evidence that I have no time doesn't allow to prevent. But let's talk. Let's just talk as Christians. No fighting. Let's just talk and discuss the word as long as we're seeking for truth. You can call me at 954-478-4673. Or send me an email at the hour of truth twenty one at gmail dot com. That is the T H E hour H O U R of truth twenty one at gmail dot com. And I look forward to hearing from you. Let's engage in discussion on these topics. Amen. Thank you. And I'll have those information linked in the description. At this time, could you close us out in prayer? Thank you. Oh, certainly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of coming together and to talk about things that concern your word, your kingdom, your government, your law. 
you're people from all different walks of life with different levels of understanding coming together just to talk about things that matter. We thank you for the privilege. We thank you for those who've tuned in to this podcast and who will listen it somewhere along the way. And we pray your blessings upon each heart. We pray that you will enlighten each mind, each understanding, and instill within each heart a desire for truth, as popular as truth might be and has always been throughout history. Instill within each heart a desire for truth, knowing that truth is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So bless us and teach us and give us understanding. Now we pray and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, Holy Savior, sanctify 